Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome back to part two of this talk about errors and uh, bladder cancer. I've often lectured about bladder cancer, but never in the realm of errors. Bladder cancer is very common, over 72,000 cases each year and 15,000 deaths in the United States. The majority are transitional cell, uh, others are squamous or adenocarcinoma. But what about the question is how often is it an incidental finding? And how often is it missed when it's an incidental finding? And what's your legal liability? And what do you look for for early bladder cancer when you're not looking at a hematuria patient or a bladder cancer patient? It's just there. I came across this case and I was asked to look at this legal case where this was the patient, came into the, ab came into the ER, acute abdomen. The radiologist correctly said ischemic bowel. This patient had surgery. Three years later, patient has a mass in the bladder. They go back. Here's the scan from that three years earlier. Sure enough, look at about 7 o'clock. There's a mass in the bladder. The study wasn't done for bladder cancer. The patient did not have IV contrast. But yes, there was a soft tissue mass there, which is twice as large here. And the person won the lawsuit. And so bladder cancers are not uncommon in older patients, and they can be incidental. And the thing about them is the small ones, I'm not talking about five centimeter mass. I'm talking about one centimeter or even less. The best thing in arterial phase imaging. And so now we do so much arterial phase imaging and we give water as an oral contrast so the bladder is distended because the patients are excreting urine and we're doing it for all sorts of exams like aortic aneurysms or other type studies. And so it's important to recognize that any enhancement of the bladder wall should be investigated further. And you have to assume it's a cancer. Focal enhancement of the bladder wall is never normal. Sometimes you say, I'm not certain if it's really in the bladder or near the bladder. Well, look at coronals and sagittals. And look how easy it is to miss things. Look at this small lesion at 7 o'clock. 5 millimeters. There it is, same lesion on the coronal. Okay, easy to miss. And of course, here it is. We got the late phase imaging. You can see it, and probably it would suggest something here. But in the early phase imaging, what do you do? Or this case, you see the little enhancement posteriorly? Maybe it's averaging with the prostate, or maybe, maybe not. Sagittal view, there it is. It's an enhancing lesion. It's about a centimeter uh, and change in size. Posteriorly, you tend to assume it's partial averaging. It's not partial averaging. It's a bladder cancer. Now you can see in this case, when I put the circle there, it's much more obvious. And look at delayed phase imaging. Look how hard it is to see. Another case, same area. I guess maybe every incidental bladder cancer is at 7 o'clock. But look at that lesion, very subtle, about a centimeter. There it is on coronal views, nicely shown. And on delayed phase. Again, these lesions are very, very subtle. Good article by Shiva Rahman talking about this. The presence of discrete bladder mass or nodules should be considered suspicious for cancer in all cases. Again, it may simply be an early zone of enhancement, and you're going to see it on arterial face imaging. It's interesting. If the patient voids before the study and the bladder is empty, you're not going to see it because the bladder is collapsed. So the better technique you use, the more likely you are to pick up small bladder cancers. In the same vein, the more likely you are to miss subtle bladder cancers. Another quote, as a result, any focal hyperenhancement of the bladder urethelium must be considered suspicious for malignancy. Okay? CT is performed for hematuria, so then we're thinking about it, but in other cases, you need to look carefully as well. Very, very important. Good rule. Okay, what else? I mentioned before that one of the common sources of error is failure to review an area with the same tenacity that you normally might. And so what this might mean is you're scanning an abdomen for a pancreatic mass or a liver mass or a renal mass, and you look at the lungs very quickly. And you look at them with thick sections. If you would have looked more carefully or used the thin sections, you might have picked up a pulmonary embolism. And this happens all of the time. In oncology patients, up to 5% of patients have incidental PEs. That's been published in the literature. 
And if you only look at the thick sections, you will miss them. And the reason we came up with this, I was looking at a lot of the um, pancreatic studies particularly. I look at only the thin sections, 0.75 for the three Ds. And in my first few sections, I would see cases like this, which were obvious PEs that were missed. On the thick sections, it's almost amazing you couldn't see it. But there it is, nice PE to the right lower lung, very clearly seen. Or this one, another case, look at that small little PE in this patient with a large pancreatic mass, representing pancreatic cancer. Or this case, look at the right lower lung again. Now it's interesting, probably 95% of all the incidental PEs I see are in the right lower lung, not the left. So I do always give the advice, if you only can look at one lung, look at the right, don't worry about the left. This way you'll pick up 95% of all lesions. And you look at the ones you pick up. Look how small these are. And this patient had presented with small bowel obstruction. Another one. Look at the PE in the right lower lung. Again, that right lower lung predominance. Very nicely shown there. And there have been several articles, this one most recently by Charlie uh, White of Maryland, making the point that if you're not careful on abdominal CTs, you will miss PEs. The challenge is greater on abdominal CTs because you're not thinking about it. So the answer is you must think about it. We talk at Hopkins, if you're doing an oncology patient, you look for lung mets, also look to make certain you're not missing a PE. Now one can argue many of the cases I just showed you or other examples of incidental PEs are often small and perhaps it's not a clot burden and perhaps you don't need to treat. That's a thought. But every time we see a patient like that, we discuss the possibility, but at the very end, no one has the courage, rightly so, just not to treat the patient. Now the problem is, is that it's very possible in patients with uh, being treated with anticoagulant therapy that you can develop a complication up to 3% a month. So treating someone with a PE is not a trivial thing, but we're still treating the patients. We use Lovenox, it's less of an issue, but it's still very important, but it's so easy to miss this. What else? Gastric tumor, and this maybe goes under my category of technique in part, how we do the study, but also goes in my category of how we read the study. Critical thing is gastric distension, and the second part is how you look at the images. Good example here, small polypoid lesion in the gastric fundus under a sonometer, easy to see because the stomach's distended. Or in this case, abdominal pain, look at the antrum. The antrum is thickened. That's not lack of distension. That's infiltration. The stomach's nicely distended. You can see the infiltration and look at the coronal view. Very nicely seen. This is a classic case of carcinoma of the stomach. Very good. You were here. You made the right diagnosis to manage the patient. But in this case, what do you do? Is this gastric pathology? Is it lymphoma? Is it carcinoma? Is it lack of distension? I don't know. Some more views here. Coronal, I don't know. Here and here. Funny vessels, but the stomach's not distended. You know, you're not gonna say there's a mass there, and you're not gonna call it normal, so you'll mumble something or other. Well, this patient was going for an EUS, so he couldn't give water, but we had scanned the patient before, and look at her stomach. Look at all of those polyps in the stomach. There's hundreds of polyps. Again, here it's very obvious, you see them, but when the stomach was not distended, you didn't see them. I talked about errors in looking at the stomach. Well, here it's very easy to miss the lesion in the fundus of the stomach, because the diaphragm is elevated and you pay attention to that. But if you did the coronal views, look how nicely you would have seen the infiltration of the patient's gastric cancer. And the same thing if you did the sagittal views, you would have seen it as well. So again, the importance of post-processing. When I talk about technique, I also talk about the dangers of arterial phase imaging when something is varices. Good example, here's a patient who was sent to us for a gastric tumor, for biopsy, and for treatment, and for surgery, probably. And you look, and you say, okay, this patient has a mass in the gastric fund. This is probably an adenocarcinoma next case. But then you look, and you say, wait a second, this patient has cirrhosis. And we learned in cirrhotic patients, there's portal hypertension often. We learn the venous structures don't enhance early. And sure enough, go back 30 more seconds, and that supposed pancreatic that supposed gastric tumor, rather, was simply large varices, okay? 
Again, timing is everything. Technique and protocol is everything. If you're uncertain, simply go back and get delayed scans. Now, another thing in terms of pitfalls, I think, this one also has two categories. One is reading the report and assuming the, the history will tell you the right answer. And two, the fact that when things are near other organs in a funny position, you can be confused. Case in point, this was sent to me as a gist tumor looking for preoperative planning. And I have to admit, and you have to admit, you look at the lesion here, it's exophytic gastric mass. It's a classic gist tumor. No problem, nothing to discuss. Well, I noticed as I was scanning, there's the mass. And you notice there's a little bit of enhancement around the periphery. Now, gist tumors can enhance, but not around the periphery. That kind of looks kind of weird. What I didn't notice here, and what you notice on all of the images, is the lesion that we thought was stomach is actually liver. And you can see it touches the left lobe of the liver, actually is pedunculated off the left lobe of the liver. We always think about hemangiomas more commonly in the right lobe, but intrahepatic lesions, not exophytic lesions. And that's typically the case, but sometimes the tumors don't know what rules to follow. And sure enough, that's what we have here. And then I was watching the lesion, and look how the lesion enhances. And I remember I said, gee, this looks like a, the enhancement of a hemangioma. Well, I read it's a gist tumor with unusual enhancement. Surgery, this was a hemangioma. The good news, the patient had left-sided pain, and so this patient needed that resected. To show you that we don't like to get fooled twice, like the who says, won't get fooled again, I hope, this lesion was sent to us off the left lobe of the liver as an angiosarcoma. So I said, boy, uh, I'm going to get a great study out of this one. And you look and you say, wait a second, look at that lesion. It's off the liver, but it's near the stomach. And how is that an angiosarcoma? You start looking at it, you say, voila, this enhances just like a hemangioma. Then you look more carefully and you say, this is simply a left lobe of the liver lesion, which is a cavernous hemangioma, classic puddling. Well, the biopsy, what happened? They biopsied a lesion that everyone said it was either stomach or liver, but they said it was malignant, and so they read it, and it was vascular, and the pathologist, not at Hopkins, of course, read angiosarcoma. When this was correctly read, this was a hemangioma. Again, the importance of timing and the importance of thinking about potential pitfalls. Now, with the liver, since I'm speaking about it, let me at least mention that one of the pitfalls, of course, is the use of arterial or not using arterial phase imaging. Arterial phase imaging, like this case, is critical for picking up small lesions in the liver, small vascular lesions. Once you go, and you can see from this case, and here it is side by side, when you look at the venous phase imaging, small lesions are often gone. They're often isodense. If you don't do arterial phase imaging, you're going to miss 30% of hepatomas at least, and surely the small ones you're going to miss. So very important, if you're looking at the liver, do dual phase imaging. Now, another thing about the liver is the importance of technique is a case like this. A patient has cirrhotic liver, and there's some funny vessels in the right lobe, which you assume are AV shunting in a patient with cirrhosis. There's no mass effect present, right? Okay, I agree. But look what happens when we go to 3D imaging. Look at that vessel now in 3D with MIP. It looks like neovascularity. This was biopsy. This was hepatoma. So again, you want to make certain you look at MIP. MIP is critical when looking at large volumes. It's very easy to pick up small vascular lesions or irregularity in the vascular flow, which can be a sign of a tumor. Very nice example. Now, it's not just the liver, pancreas, same thing, timing. This was a patient who was referred to us for a mass in the tail of the pancreas, question resectability. You look quickly, it looks like a tail of the pancreas mass involving the stomach and around the uh, patient's arterial structures. But instead of looking at the arterial phase images, you go to venous phase, and now look what happens. Everything that looked like a gastric mass is really large varices in the patient's stomach. And this patient did not need to come to pancreatic conference the next day. But look how nicely you can see the varices, the extent of varices, and involvement. Another area, pancreas. Pancreas has always been a challenge. And if I think about some of the pancreatic lesions we talk about, um, we'll know that the issues tend to be misdiagnoses of the lesion detection, which we're getting much better at picking up small lesions, isodense lesions. But also the issue becomes um, 
what, how good are we in defining pancreatic masses and being specific as to what type of pancreatic mass? Well, there are pitfalls. Pancreatic masses versus peripancreatic masses, undiagnosed neuroendocrine tumors, misdiagnosis of splenic artery aneurysm as an islet cell tumor or a splenule as an islet cell tumor. There are many, many mistakes. And so what I like to do is go through some of the mistakes, but I think perhaps we'll take a few minute break and then we'll come back and do that. Be right back. <laughs> 